<laughs> well, amen. Amen. You know, I, uh, I've said so many times that I just love the Word of God. I, I do. Uh, I can get into that and just get lost, you know, because of the many blessings that we see in there. You ever get that bad feeling things aren't going to go good? Man, I'm getting it. <laughs> I do not know what that sound was. But anyway, I do love God's Word. You know, when I get into the book of Revelation, I, I love reading it. Uh, I, I don't spend the time I used to in it, but I, I do still enjoy spending time there. But I enjoy it with the Old Testament more because I can see so many of the things in the Old Testament coming out through the book of Revelation and into the New Testament. And I don't think we can have one without the other. They have to tie together because if we, they don't tie together, we're going to miss something in a great way. And we'll kind of see that this morning. But I want to look at something here that... I don't know why it went back, but there we go. I want to look at something called the seven blessings of the overcomer. Now, if you look at this and you know anything about the book of Revelation, you're going to see in there that there's seven blessings to each one of the churches that are given. And I don't really want to do a study of the churches, but I do want to do a study on, on the, the overcomer blessings. Because that's what we're going to receive if we follow the word of God. If we're living into that and we're seeing all the beauty of it, the power of it, and how that can affect my life. I think the sad part about it, we look at these things and we never realize that that's for me. That, that's something for me. And it's something that if I'm going to be that overcomer, I have to work on those things now. I don't have a chance once I leave this earth. Once I leave this earth, it's done. It, it's over. Everything I have accomplished. Uh, I like what um, Marcia said to Michelle about the crown. I, I wanted to, to be the joker I am and say, well, don't get too attached to that crown, Michelle, because you ain't going to have it long. You're going to have to lay that at the feet of Jesus. You know, but you can enjoy it for a bit. And, uh, but that's the joy. Think of, think of the crowns that we'll be able to lay at his feet. You know, the Bible's specific on that, and a lot of people don't even take that into realization, but there's five crowns that each one of us can obtain. And because of that, there's something else that, uh, I, I, I hate to use the word incentive, but puts a joy in our heart to be able to receive, to know that I'm working, there's a soul winner's crown, and, you know, it goes on and on and on, and one day maybe we'll do a, a series on them. But I do want to take time to look at this, because when we look at this overcomer, that's what I need to be. I have to be an overcomer. There's a story told about a missionary couple that lived their lives in the mission field. For years they served and basically they was as many missionaries. They served without much reward. They left everything. They left family. They left homes, jobs, everything to go to the field because that's where they believe that God called them to. So they spent almost their entire life on the field and as they grew older, they decided it was just time to come home. They come in to, to the airport and they landed and they come out and they heard this big band out there and uh, just all this commotion and they thought, man, they're there for us. They're there to welcome us home for the mighty work that we've done on the field. Well, when they got out there, they realized it wasn't for them. There was a dignitary on that flight, and it was for them. And there was nobody to meet them. They sit there all alone, took a cab to a, a cheap hotel somewhere, and spent the night. And as they sat there that night, the, the man started to cry. And he goes to his wife, we've left everything. We left everything. We left our homes, our friends. We've left everything. And we come back. There's nobody here to greet us. We're here in this dumpy hotel room. And she goes, and when we get home, there's going to be nobody to greet us. And his wife, you got to love a godly wife. She looked right at him and she said, that's because we're not going to be home yet. Oh, perspective, perspective. So many times we look at life with the wrong perspective. We have to keep we're going to have to keep to a place where we can have that ability to look at life and know that I can overcome. And you know, when we look at this, we realize so many times that we focus on the sorrows. You know, we never look at the joy. I don't care how bad your life is, there's still joy in your life. You just have to see it. You just have to find it. You can't get down on a situation and say, this is all there is. You know, you can't get to life. I mean, before I was in Christ, I did. That's one reason how I came to Christ, and I can relate with that video. Because of this, I realized my wife was worth nothing. It wasn't where I needed to be. 
if this is this all there is and that's when I come to Christ I realize that there is something better and that there's something more so when I see this I look at this many times that I can't view my sorrows but yet we do we look at life and we realize are all these trials that I'm coming in beating me down you look at this and you say I look at people and, and they get fed up with a Christian life and they just walk away they duck their head in shame and they walk away come on now, come on now we quit that easy we make the devil's job pretty simple we just allow the flesh to beat us down but we live the same way as the Israelites the Israelites in their day decided to go back too. they seen it tough in the wilderness and all of a sudden it was better to live back in Egypt that place of sin they wanted to go back but God didn't allow them gratefully but then there's the tax of the enemy and we know them well he comes at us from every direction how many times does the devil come in and say hey hey, hey you're not good enough to do that I've heard that all my life but you know what you ain't nobody so when those people come up and say hey you can't do that you just smile say well I sure have been doing it a long time for somebody they ain't able to do it I don't pay attention to that stuff no more I don't I thought it was you're the one with the problem not me you know maybe you're looking at it wrong so when we look at these things and we begin to see them, the enemy comes at us from all directions but then there's them trials of daily life and we all face them the sorrows the hurts the pain the suffering it's a continual battle against the flesh to crucify that thing to where it don't affect us but at the same time when we look at life we have to realize that it's a small price to pay in this life for what we're going to get at the end now from what I heard with Michelle this morning there ain't no way I'd trade anything for that crown I don't know how many I'm going to get I hope I get all five of them but that's not in my hands all I can do is work towards it but the thing of it is is this those crowns are special because every one of us that received them crowns are going to turn them right around and lay them at the feet of Jesus because he's the only one worthy to wear them and to me that's exciting but I want to have five crowns to lay at his feet because that to me is going to be a glorious moment in the book of Revelation it's an amazing thing and we hear so much if you're on YouTube for very long you hear constantly about the book of Revelation the rapture but they all focus on the judgment it's all about the judgment you know and I, I, I get tired of that you know I get so tired of hearing about the judgment you know there's a lot of blessings in that book the only the greatest view of heaven we have is in the book of Revelation why aren't we looking at that that's where we're going why don't I look at the first three chapters that's where I'm at now because that's the reward that I'm going to get if I abide by the work that's in them churches and every church in this world is centered around those seven churches that they fit into that mode in that category so in this series we're going to look at the blessings of Revelation there's seven of them as I said but they're only for one person and that's the overcomer they're not given to anyone else it, it saddens me that everybody thinks they're gonna get all these blessings in heaven Carl <laughs> but when we look at this and we begin to see it it's an amazing thing because everybody sit there saying oh I'm this great Christian I'm living the Christian life well I've watched your life no you're not but they still claim the promises and I hope they get them I hope they're there to re realize them but there's one thing I want to point out before we get into all that and that is the number seven I love looking at the scriptures and seeing numbers you know, the numbers are fascinating to me because all the numbers in the Bible they all mean something they all got meaning this is one here seven the number seven is always used for the number of perfection no matter where you go you're gonna see sevens and that's what it stands for it denotes such things as completion or perfection it's that drive to action you know it, it, as we look at scripture it, it's all over the place in it uh, and that's what excites me and that's where I find it fun because if you look at Genesis in Genesis 131 it says and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good it wasn't just good it just wasn't okay it was very good it, it was awesome but know what he said in the evening and the morning were the sixth day 
and then God rested on the seventh. Why did he rest on the seventh? Seven is the number of completion. It was finished. It was finished at that moment. God's work was done and it was good. So when I look at that and I look at my life and all these people saying, oh, this guy's bad, that guy's bad. No, he was still good because he was created in the image of God. We are still good. It's just a matter of we're wayward and need to come back. So when we look at this, it's a fascinating thing to me. Now watch this one because this is where we see another time. And there's tons of these, but I'm just going to show you three. In Genesis 7, 2, he had seven pair of clean animals. We know when had, uh, Noah got off the ark. He took those seven animals and he sacrificed them because it was the number of perfection. It was the, that completion. It was over. But then we also see it here in Leviticus. Moses consecrated Aaron and his sons for the priesthood. And they had to remain out of the tabernacle area for seven days. And this number goes on and on and on through Scripture. You get into Revelation, and there's a whole slew of them. From the seven churches, to the candlesticks, to the angels. There's many instances of seven. So it, it, it sets it right up for the, the opportunity to see the power of this when we come to this list. So when we see the blessings here, it's something that we have to take note of. We can't just let this slip by us and say it's of no value. It's of great value to us. And if we can understand it and we can see what we're going to receive, it makes all the difference in the world. Now watch this verse, because this is where it starts. In Revelation chapter 2, he says, and he is Jesus, that hath an ear, let him, that's you, that's me. It isn't just for this people that was written on in John's day. It was for everyone that hears the word of Revelation. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Us. It's us. I love that. I love when the Bible sits there and says, Hey, this is for you. Yeah, I'm on it. And it brings blessing and joy. But know what he says. To him that overcometh will I give. This is a blessing from God. A blessing of the Lord Jesus. He will give me the opportunity to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Oh, man. Oh, I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for that one. You talk about a picture of beauty. I can't even begin to fathom what that must look like. To me, this is a special opportunity. Now, this was given to the church at Ephesus. Now, because of this, it's interesting, because they were also condemned. Every one of these churches, but one really was condemned. Some say two, but I go with one. So when we look at this and we begin to see it, it's pretty interesting of what takes place. Because he sits there and says that they were condemned for their labor, or commended for their labor and their faith. But they were also condemned for this. They were condemned for the fact that they left their first love. Oh, do we see this today? And everybody says, oh, I'm still sitting in church. I'm still sitting here. That's the problem. So many people are just sitting. It's easy to sit somewhere. It truly is. But if we could take this and take it one step further and allow this to be something that changes my life, what a difference it will make. That way that everything that I think, everything that I desire, everything I long for is centered on that love of Christ. Ralph, when Ralph prays, he always talks about uh, the, uh, uh, the love of God. And to me, that um, uh, agape love, it's, it's incredible. It's a godly love. And this is what God is wanting us to return to. He's wanting us to come to that place where he is receiving the same love that he's giving. Now, he's not asking me to have that type of love with Brother Glick or, or Ralph or Marilyn. He's asking me to have that love for him. For him. Because it's going to be hard for us to, to agape somebody else. But we can with God. Because we know it's coming back. So to me it's precious to be able to see all this work. Now here we see this verse. Nevertheless I have something against thee because thou hast left thy first love. He made it very clear. Very, very clear. And I said before, many lay claim to these, these blessings. They lay claim to it and say, oh, I'm a good Christian man. Oh, then why are you living like you are? You're just surrendering to the flesh. 
I mean, tell it like it is. I mean, that's reality. It's easy to sit there and take the name of something and say, Oh, I'm good. I'm good. They believe in Jesus. Well, let me tell you something. The devil believes in Jesus, and there isn't a single demon that doubts him. How many times did Jesus stifle the demon when he wanted to say, Yay, you are the Son of God. Jesus told him to be quiet. They knew who he was. They knew who he was. But when we look at people and we see them in this way, they're not the overcomer. And this blessing is not for them. It is only to that one that surrenders his life and lives with that belief. Realize something, I got a lot of beliefs. I believe in a lot of things. If I sat there on that pew, I believe with all my heart that it's going to hold me up. It's never failed me. It's not failing Brother Glick. I could sit down there and be just as safe, just as comfortable. I believe in that, but I don't put my faith in that. I don't put my faith in that. It's a matter of putting that in, my, in the place where it belongs. This tells me that I must live a life of faith. I must live that life of faith. And it <clears throat> bothers me somewhat because everybody talks about faith. Faith, 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 faith. Well, without faith, we have nothing. Without faith, we have nothing. We have to walk with that faith. If I have the faith that I can overcome, I'm going to overcome. Go back to David. I mean, I love David. I can't wait to meet David. I just can't wait. I think he's just going to be the most awesome guy to say, hey, I got a question for you, little fella. We need to talk. Tell me about the day you dropped that big dude. Tell me about that, because that's awesome to me. Was he scared? Did he have a little fear? I don't think he did. Why? Because he had faith. He had faith. And faith will get us through so many things in our life. Because faith will give us courage. It will give us courage to stand when everybody else wants to stop. I want you to note the word. Because when we look at this, if this blessing is to the overcomer, we need to know what that is. I found this picture. I love this. This river that we will see in heaven is coming from the throne of God. And it's going to line the streets. And these trees are on either side. But watch. This is the first blessing. The first blessing we see will be that we will eat of the tree of life. Oh, this is powerful. This is powerful. If we could just grasp it and see the power of it all. We are in a great battle that rages all around us. It's always around us. It never leaves. It's always there. But it's a battle that when I come to Jesus, I cannot get away from. Now the world can go through their lives and say, eh, it's nothing to me. I'm good. But the reason why is you have nothing to fight for. You already surrendered. You're just going to have your happy day here because your sad days are coming. You just don't realize it yet. You just don't realize it yet. I love to watch boxing, MMA. I love that. Man, I can watch that stuff. We used to watch it all the time. Don't watch it much anymore. But I, 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 I didn't love it, but I, I thought it was interesting when somebody get knocked out. Because you'd watch some guys get knocked out, they'd hit them and boom, man, place plant right on the ground. But then there's them other guys. Them's the guys that scared me. Because they didn't know they was knocked out. They didn't. I mean, they would get whop, boy. I mean, they would get hammered. And they would just stand there, you know, trying to fight. I watched a video yesterday. This guy was boxing. There wasn't even nobody there. I mean, he, and the guy was standing behind him. That's a picture of the world right there. That's a picture of the world. Because they don't even realize they've lost. They, don't, they just don't know enough to fall down. And that's where the world's at. But us... I'll fight, and I'll fight to the end, because I know right there, that's what's waiting on me. That's what's waiting on me. I can't even fathom the picture of that in my mind. Those rivers directly out of the throne of God that runs down that street and waters those trees. Oh, man, what a picture that's going to be. What a picture. I could go on with that one, but I need to move on. I don't have a watch, so I have no idea what time it is. So you're in trouble. Nah, you're not. I'm kidding. I do not have a watch, though. But when we look at this, I want you to go to another scripture. Because a lot of times we think we're all alone in this fight. 
Now I want to give you some encouragement here. It's easy to stand up here and wail and holler and say, you need to get right with God, but why? Why? I'm just going to get beat up. I want you to watch a scripture. And this is something you've all heard, but I want to look at it again. Uh, that's not supposed to be there. That's not supposed to be there. Here we go. And when the Lord, uh, 2 Kings, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 6, 15 through 18. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, I love this, fear not. Oh, here's this little servant. He's scared to death. He don't know what to do. He sees all these chariots about to take him out. There's nothing they can do. They have no army. It's just him and Elijah. Or Elijah, one of them. Anyway, when we get this, we see an interesting thing. Now watch what happens here. For, for they that be with us are more than they be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. That's a powerful statement right there. We need to have our spiritual eyes open so that we can see the spiritual and realize the help that we have in that. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to Elisha, prayed unto the Lord, and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Oh, never underestimate your prayers. Never. Never underestimate the desire that you need for God to step into your life. We have joy right there. Because we are not alone. You are not fighting this alone. You have a whole host of heaven around you. Oh, man, that ought to give us some stiffness in our backbone that we can stand up and say, come on, take your best shot. Take your best shot. But you better be ready for it. Because it takes faith. It takes faith. And if you do not have faith, you will miss that. You will miss that. I think that's a powerful, powerful statement. We are not alone. We must fight. If we are going to be the conqueror or that overcomer, we must fight. We have to. Because we have no other choice. Why? Because of this. We all are going to walk that street one day if we are in Christ. We are going to eat of those trees on that river. Oh, oh, what a blessing that is. What a blessing. To me, this is so fascinating. Jesus takes this to an amazing place. Now, I bought a commentary from this guy because everybody, these scholars are saying this guy had to Use the best on Revelation. So I'm on it. So I bought it. Don't. <laughs> don't. Because I don't agree with what he says. But I do agree with this part. Watch what he says here. Beale states this. To eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, is alluded to again at the conclusion of the book as a picture of forgiveness, where it is a clear reference to the restoration of mankind to its original and fallen state. Oh, that's an awesome statement right there. And that tells you everything about that tree in God's paradise. To me, it's an amazing thing because it's a process of forgiveness that when we see this, we can realize that Christ now brought this back to us. He brought it back. What we realize is, is an opportunity as an overcomer. Now think about this. Don't, don't let me lose you here. The tree in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis was an earthly tree. It was planted on earth. When Adam ate of that tree, that tree was no longer there. But when we see it in the new Jerusalem, it's going to be a heavenly tree. It's a heavenly tree that's going to be planted in the midst of God's garden. Oh, and I don't know about you. Apparently that didn't excite you as much as it did me. But, but that to me was exciting. Because now we see a blessing that came to us through this tree. We all have heard our entire life of sickness and pain is not going to be in heaven. How many have heard of that? We're, going to have, we're not going to have none of that stuff. Now, this is what I have fun with. When somebody tells me that, I say, well, how's all that work? How's all that work? 
And man, it's like, not a clue. I just believe it. Well, I have to tell you what, I'm about to put some meat to your belief here. So when we look at this, we know exactly how to answer that question. And this is why. And it's right there in that tree. It's right there in that tree. Because to me, there's nothing that's, that's better than that. The answer is this tree. Now, I want you to look at this verse of scripture. Because it's amazing how the Bible works together. Now, if you look at this, we're going to look in, in uh, Galatians 3. But Paul got this from Deuteronomy, get it right here, Deuteronomy 21, 23. And this is what Paul says. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on, hangeth on a tree. We know he's talking about the, res or the crucifixion of Jesus. We know that in that time, Jesus bought that and, and paid for it in such a mighty way. But what we have to understand is this. The man Adam lost the garden. He lost it when they sinned and they bit of the tree. When that happened, they got cast out of the garden. We all know the story. What happened after that is that they were cast out of the garden and God put cherubims in front of the gates so they couldn't get back in. Why? Why? It says so they wouldn't go back in and eat of the tree of life. Because if they were to eat of that tree of life, they would have lived in their sin forever. Couldn't happen. Now, the question I have is at some point, did Adam eat of that before? And this is what throws everybody. If you believe in a younger theory, that may be all well and good. But how long did he live in that garden? Because he could have ate of that tree, lived for a while, had to eat it again, lived for a while, and then they sinned and they couldn't eat of the tree no more. But they still lived for 900 years. So when we look at this, it's an amazing thing when you start to look at it because this is fascinating. Adam, from a tree that brought death to a man, and by a tree, God brought freedom from death to all men. I hope you got that because this is a vital thing to our doctrine. What Adam lost in the garden, the first Adam, the last Adam replaced and he did it from the tree of the cross. Oh, that's awesome to me. That is so awesome to me. What a picture we have. No Revelation 22, 2. This is where we see the tree. Now watch. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. Now watch, because this is interesting. Which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Right there is your answers to how you will be healed in heaven continually. It's right there. That tree is there for your healing. Jesus provided it on the cross. Ah, man, apparently that didn't excite you as much as it did me. Because to me, that's incredible. That's incredible. And I can hang on to that so when the fights come, I just keep looking to that tree. Oh, I may get down a day, or two, maybe three, but I'm coming back. I used to tell everybody that a Christian was like one of them weeble wobble things. You know, when you're a kid, you'd hit that thing and it'd pop over and pop right back up. That's what we need to be. You need to be that weeble wobble. When you get hit, you get back up. Say, do it again. Do it again. I'm ready for you next time. But I'm here to tell you next time you're going to get knocked down probably just the same way. But the key is to get back up. The key is to get back up. You don't believe me, watch this. Paul and Silas, just been beaten with an inch of their lives, cast into the prison, down there, bloody, sore, probably crying, because they're in so much pain. But what'd they do at midnight? Praising, singing glory to God. Oh, don't tell me singing ain't important. Don't tell me glorifying God ain't important. Because at that moment, they were down. Man, they didn't stay there. They got back up, started praising God, and the whole place was shaken. And how many people were led to Jesus that night because of that act? That whole family was one to Christ. So when we look at this, it's an amazing thing. We see a picture here of the New Jerusalem. Ah, oh, what a place that's going to be. I've often wondered what heaven looks like because nobody knows. Nobody has a clue. We know what the New Jerusalem looks like, but that's not heaven. That's the New Jerusalem. But if the New Jerusalem is that awesome, what must heaven be like? Oh, whoa, what a day that'll be.
But what we see is something that's interesting here. We see the New Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of debate on this, and, and I don't understand why, but we debate the meaning of it all. Now, if you get into the book of Revelation, and anybody that's ever studied it for very long knows that there's all kinds of types and shadows in there, and all through the Word of God is filled with types and shadows from, from Joseph and the book of Genesis all the way to, to the very end. I love them. I do. I love look at them types and shadows because, man, they can speak to you in a great way. But a lot of people try to say this tree is the same way. It's a type and a shadow of something else. Ah, I differ there. I don't believe so. This is a literal tree. Otherwise, God would have not have put them cherubims with that fire or uh, flaming swords to guard it so no man touch it or eat of it. This is a real tree. Now, I want to show this to you because I, I think this is an incredible thing. Many think, oh, that's just in the book of Revelation. No, you're wrong. You need to look, start looking through your prophets because this is prophesied way, way before Revelation. Note Ezekiel. I think of all the people in the Bible, oh, Ezekiel, he's got to be the strangest one. I mean, you start reading his word, no. It, man, I, I, I'll be honest, most of it I don't understand. But I'm awed by him. I mean, his character must have been something else. But know what he says here. In Ezekiel 47, 12. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat. Now, uh, I think I got that here in a minute. I'll show it in a second. Whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his month, because their waters they issue out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Oh, my. There it is. There it is. Right there is how you receive your healing. And while that does to me is back up the book of Revelation of what we see in it. It's going to be the completion of what Ezekiel gave us. Oh, man, don't tell me them prophets aren't important. They're very important to us. And they show us great things. The word meat means this. Because sometimes it will confuse you with wording here. But that word meat means food or fruit meat. Vittles. Oh, man, I wonder what that fruit tastes like. I love peaches. I don't eat them much, but I, I love them when they're ripe. Man, you bite into that thing and it just runs down your face and all over your t-shirts. Oh, that's good stuff. But when we look at this, think of that. Every month it's going to produce fruit and different fruit. Can't wait to taste that fruit. What a blessing it's going to be. I'm awed by this, and I'm thrilled by the fact that we see all of this in our lives. But this is no different than Adam in the garden. We will have that opportunity. It's why we take such good care of it. I talked about them flaming swords. This is where we read about it. So he drove out the man, and he placed it at the east of the Garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way, uh, keep the way of the tree of life, keep him away from it. That would be an awesome sight, I'm telling you right now. That would been an awesome sight. That had been an awesome sight. But that's how much God loves us right there. A lot of people, how can you say that? Because he kept us away from that tree. Because if we had ate of that, we'd have never had no chance. Oh, what a blessing God is for us. And what a joy he puts into our lives. We have to realize this, that it's, that it's, not, it's not something that we need to fear this life. We don't need to fear the hard times. Without Jesus being our sacrificial lamb, we would have never had the ability to partake of this tree. I want to partake of that tree. I want to have that a part of my life. I don't believe that we will ever see the full extent of this scripture, uh, or the knowledge of it, I should say. I, I think there's so much to this. We will never know this side of heaven. But I do know this. I know that when I see this and I, and I read this, it... it, it it's amazing to me because when we see this, it gives me encouragement. It gives me strength because it gives me the opportunity to know that whatever comes my way, I can stand. I can be like David. I can plant my feet, reach in my bag, grab my stone, put it in my sling, and drop that giant in my life. I have that ability. Why? Because I know that just as David killed the lion and the bear, I killed that one last week. I can kill you this week. We have that opportunity because I know the promises that I have 
and being an overcomer. And this is the first one, and I'm so glad God put this one first. When Jesus uttered this one, I'm thinking, yeah. I'm glad he didn't start out with Laodicea. You know, I can look at this and I can grab a hold of that tree and I can see the fruit and the blessings. Oh, what a blessing we have. Oh, what a blessing. This ought to encourage us to stand strong. I close by this. I close by saying, look around and see that the world has nothing to offer. This is where I really struggle with people that fall, people that turn their back on Jesus. For the joys of sin for a season. Church, stay strong. Stay strong. Because the reward is going to far outweigh any little reward we might find in this life. To eat of that tree, I desire that. Could you imagine all of us walking down there together, Jesus leading us through, and he says, hey, you want to taste something good? Try this one, man. Get this one. This stuff's great. Oh, oh, what a joy that'll be. Oh, I don't think heaven will be that stuffy. I think we're going to have fun. I think we're going to have fun. It'll be serious, but we'll have fun. How could you not? Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I am so awed by it, and I love it so much. I pray that we can constantly hunger for it, that we can see the beauty of it. Father, we hear so much about sin and judgment. Sometimes it's just nice to sit back and see the reward and the blessing. Father, we know this world's tough. We know what's coming our way, and it's going to be a hard life to live. But, Father, we know that your word tells us you're coming soon. So I pray that we can continue to be the overcomer. We can walk with a, a steadfast faith. Father, that nothing would detour us, nothing would stop us, nothing would hold us back. Father, there will be days that we will fall. There will be days that we, we just don't want to go on. But, Father, we know that those days won't last long, that we will get, pick ourselves back up and we will go forward. Because, Father, that reward is far greater. And I know that your word tells me that you will give me the strength. With heads bowed and eyes closed.